Our next speaker this morning is Ralph Clockers on uniform periodic wave front sets and zero loci of functions of CX class. Thank you. Before I start, I should mention this is joint work with Eisenbutt, Gordon, Halep, Soclesaire, and Rebo in various combinations. I decided to skip the word uniform from the title and make it more concrete because that will be sufficient to explain all the uh, concepts more clearly. And uh, I would invite you to ask any question uh, according to certain definitions as all of you have different backgrounds, sometimes very different backgrounds. So um, skipping the word uniformly means I fix a local field which is a finite field extension of QP finite and on top of that I also fix an additive character from this local field F to the complex circle. Additive character meaning it's a continuous group homomorphism from the field F with addition to the unit circle with complex multiplication. non-trivial. <coughs> On this, my first thing I will define, and sorry for the cracking, I try to be... <laughs> calm, I need to say calm. <laughs> Maybe the sound can be put down and I can speak louder so there is a compromise between cracking and non-cracking. Um, so what language should I use? I use the language of rings with coefficients from the field F. Language of rings contains, sorry? continuous group homomorphism. So that's what is called an additive character. Yeah. Yes. So I use a language of rings and this will say when x inside f to the n is a definable set and also it will give me when a function is called definable. Sorry, can the volume be put down? Take it off, yes. Now it's... Or I don't know, I don't know. Okay. Um, so, no questions so far. Let's go to the next step of algebras of complex valued functions on definable sets. So, um, if I have a definable set X, there, I consider the following algebra denoted by CX of X. It's the, the C algebra consisting of C valued functions. with the pointwise operations in complex numbers for the functions. And it's generated by generators of three kinds. The first kind of generator is the norm of a definable function on x. So if f is a definable function, sure. If f is a definable function, which is f valued, you can take its norm. And I'm going to normalize the norm to be q, the number of elements of the residue field, to the power minus the order of f, where I take as value group the integers. So the order lands in surjectively onto the integers, and q to the minus infinity is zero. The second kind of generator is the order 
of G, where also G is definable, but now let's say non-zero. Definable functions. generator is a composition of the additive character with another definable function c psi, psi of h and h again is from x to f also a definable function so an algebra means you can take sums and products finite sums and products you cannot divide you cannot quantify in logic we are used to taking quantifications, building, cooking up new stuff. This is not allowed here. It's an algebra. Why is this algebra natural or even interesting? That's because it has nice properties. And this is almost a little bit classical. So let me just briefly mention the properties. This algebra of functions is closed under integration. That's why it was defined like this. So if you integrate some of the variables out, what you get in the remaining variables is still of the same kind. So stable under integration. This was why it was cooked, uh, d defined like that, this algebra. So in particular, it's also stable under Fourier transformation because this additive character is like exponential 2 pi i of some input. It's an oscillating thing. It's how you cook up Fourier transforms. So it's stable under Fourier transformation, meaning if you have a function of this kind, of the kind Cx, which is integrable, L1, in the measure theoretic L1 sense, you can take its Fourier transform. It will remain in that class. But it's stable under other operations as well. For example, undertaking limits. And uh, before explaining this, let me introduce a little bit more notation. So a function, um, a function in cx x of x is called let's call it of cx class just a way of speaking more easily and let's generalize this notion a little bit if i have now a function um, a function which has a different domain, namely x times z, for example, or z to the r to the complex numbers. I also sometimes want to call it of cx class. It cannot be of cx class because I only define cx class on definable sets. And this is not a definable set. So let's call this of cx class. Whenever, if I lift it, the lift uh, to a function from x times x star n via the map, which is the component-wise order map, r. And here I have this function f. Here I have c. And here I have the unique lift. And this function, this lift, should be of cx class. Then I call the function on this integers also of cx class. This is all very classical. And then I can speak, of course, of sequences inside, uh, sequences of functions in CX class, namely uh, a sequence, FR, R positive natural numbers, um, is called of CX class. Well, if you combine it in this way, so the function then sending X comma R 
at r of x should be of cx class in the previous set. And then I can talk about limits. And the, this class is stable under taking pointwise limits. So if the pointwise limit exists, you remain in the class. But also stable under taking L1, L1 limits and also L2 limits. In the measure theoretic sense, you can take the L2 limits. The L2 limit, if the L2 limit exists, it will be in the class. So this allows us to have stability also for Fourier transformation of L2 functions. Because the L2, the Fourier transform of an L2 function is defined as a limit, uh, or can be defined as a limit of Fourier transforms of L1 functions. Excuse me, I have a question on Fourier transform. For R A in X, you have Fourier transform. Um, no, it's on Fn. So the Fourier transform, say, on, uh, on Fn. And then you get function on the dual. On the dual of Fn, which you can write also as Fn, because we have the natural pairing natural <coughs> identification with the psi. So this is, this is it about the second point, the algebras, why they are natural and uh, handy. Let's go to the third point, and that's the low C. Is there a third? The low C. Okay, so a, natu a third natural concept, um, natural in the sense that it will interplay quite deeply with the other concepts, is that of uh, zero loci. Yes, I can try. Zero loci of functions of CX class. So this is just an algebra of functions. You can form zero loci. An important thing that you should notice is it's, it has a different flavor than zero loci of polynomials in algebraic geometry. There you have a Noetherian topology. Here, a zero locus need not make the dimension small. For example, you can take the characteristic function of a single point, and the zero locus will be everything except that point. So zero loci can be dense, can be big. It's not an Ethereum topology that you get on, the, on these loci. So that's just a, a side remark. But why are they important? Well, we never wanted to study them in, the, in themselves. But what we wanted to study is the following thing. If you have a family of functions of CX class, so you have F on a definable set times maybe Fn to, to, uh, to F, uh, to C, sorry, complex numbers of CX class, you, can want, to s you, you want to see for which parameters X is the function you get as the family member on fn to c. So fx, and here you have uh, the dot function, meaning you send y in fn to xy, the function on fn. Those family members, which are L1. This is a locus that you can call the locus of integrability. And uh, we studied this locus of integrability with a lot of properties, like uh, if it's dense, it is of a certain form. If its complement is dense, it's of a certain form. And suddenly we noticed that actually we can describe it, catch it by a more general concept. And uh, these loci of integrability are always a zero locus of some other function living on x, of CX class. So, and vice versa, any zero locus of a function of CX class on x can appear as a zero, as a locus of integrability. So it's really the right concept. And then we went on and we said, okay, you can form other conditions here. You can look at family members which are locally constant, bounded, L2, um, var various uh, things. And 
almost always we found the correspondence between the zero loci and, uh, and uh, the locus with that specific kind of condition. For example, here you can put local constancy and you can put some eventual behavior that I will specify later. Eventual behavior, so behavior if you go to infinity. So they come up a lot of the time and they need to come up. So we, we try to develop a formalism of the loci themselves. Of course, it's easy to see a finite union of loci is a locus. A finite intersection of this zero loci remains a zero locus just by make, taking products and sums of squares and things like that. Um, but the complement of a zero locus is not always a zero locus. So it's not closed undertaking complement. It's also not stable undertaking quantifiers. So if you have a zero locus, you would quantify some of the variables out. What you get in the other variables may not be a zero locus anymore. But as it may be natural to think, if you know about uh, some variants of logic, it's also stable under universal quantification. So if you have an expression like this thing for each y in fn, and you have a cx class function in more variables, then this kind of condition is actually exactly the same as a zero locus condition in the sense that there exists another function um, of cx class so that they describe the same set in the x variables. Exactly exactly the same. Well, there is again a correspondence. For so there is our stable, stable under some operations. So for all y of x, y is what? Uh, zero, sorry. So if you have a zero locus condition, of so zero locus, you take, uh, but remember this is closed under positive Boolean combinations, but not negations. You can quantify this way, you get the zero locus. Thank you. Um, so that's it about loci. And uh, you can also form a locus, for example, of the existence of limits. For a certain member, a limit could exist. For other members, the limit cannot exist, and so on. Let's now go to the last point there, the distribution. Maybe I use it here. So I, uh, for simplicity, I work with distribution. A distribution psi on fn. You can also work or work consider distributions on manif sub-manifolds of fn, definable sub-manifolds, for example. But in abstract uh, analysis, a distribution on fn is just a C-linear map from the space of test functions on fn, which I will describe in a minute, to the complex numbers. So any test function you plug in, and you get a complex number. What are the test functions in this periodic case that maybe you're not all familiar with? These are just functions which have compact support. So there are zero if you go far away enough. And moreover, they are locally constant. Locally constant in the reals, you should think C infinity. C infinity in the reals becomes locally constant here. So if you would work on real vector spaces, you would get. Uh, and uh, the, the zeroness, if you go far away in the reals, typically this becomes very fast decay in the Schwarz function's sense. So uh, that's an extra benefit in the Piedi case. You don't need extra topological conditions because this space is so simple. The topology here allows you to just speak about C linear maps and, and it gives continuity in already automatically if it's C linear. Yeah. That's the standard. Um, so let's now say a distribution Xi is of Cx class. This is also a very basic and natural uh, notion. Let me first say it in words, which are a bit catchy. Xi is called of CX class if and only if 
its continuous wavelet transform is a function of Cx class. And functions we know when they are of Cx class. So continuous wavelet transform with mother wavelet, just the characteristic function of a ball, of a box, a ball. So wave, you use the wavelet transform, but let me spell it out. So this is just a catchy phrase. Um, if I would form the function f on fn times z, which sends a tuple x and an integer r to the evaluation of the distribution on the characteristic function of the ball around x of radius, valuative radius r, I get a, a complex number. And this function should be of Cx class. So that's, that's a easy extension of functions to distributions to be of that class. And this is equivalent to asking that the continuous wavelet transform is of Cx class. Of course, nobody is defined in the periodic uh, wavelet transform, but just by analogy. Um, it's not hard to see that the distribution of this class is automatically smooth on a dense open, even on a dense open definable in Fn. So let me explain that what it means, because that's a starting point to go beyond this property. What is the smooth locus of a distribution of psi that's defined as those sets, those points in the space where psi lives on, so with notation like there, distribution on Fn, such that um, if you restrict psi to a small open around x, x u small open, small enough open, um, you get a, a distribution which is locally constant. Uh, so that restriction is locally constant. And what does that mean? It means actually that you have a locally constant density function, so to say, and calculating the distribution is just calculating the integral of the test function times the density function. So it's a locally constant. In the reals, you would say it's locally C infinity. If you take a small, small thing with compact support, it becomes locally C infinity. When you say it's locally constant, it's not that it means it makes U even smaller, it becomes constant, right? Yes. Okay, so you can take Yes. Let's call this the smooth locus of Xi. And the complement has also a name. It's called the singular support. And it's maybe written like singular support of Xi. And as I said, in the CX class, the smooth locus is always open dense, even um, related to an open dense definable set with an inclusion in one way, but it's not always equal to, it's not always definable. So what is it? So there is a fact for a general distribution psi, not necessarily of our class, um, any open, any open subset can be the smooth locus. can be the smooth locus of Xi. So the singular support can be any closed set. Not so in the CX class case. Um, if Xi is, as I said before, is of CX class, then the, um, so we catch the right nature of 
the smooth lossy of these, of these distributions. This is not so deep a result. It's a recent observation. It's a nice, it shows the naturality of the concepts, but it's not really, really difficult. But if you want to work with distributions, you want to manipulate them. For example, you want to transform them. You want to pull them back. You want, if you have two distributions, you would want to multiply them maybe. And sometimes you can do that, sometimes not. And that depends a little bit on the singular support. If the singular supports of two distributions are disjoint, then you can multiply them. Because then locally, it's like multiplication with uh, a, a locally constant thing. And if you're in the singular support of the one thing, you're locally constant for the other. So you can take the product of the two distributions easily. The same for the pullback. If your singular support is sufficiently different from, so to say, the, the singular nature of your mapping that you want to pull back along, then you can take the pullback of that distribution easily. But if the singular nature of your mapping intersects the singular support, maybe you can, maybe not. And therefore, about 40, 50 years ago, the time around when I was born, Hörmander developed a finer notion than the singular support and the smooth locus, which gives a very fine criterion, even if the singular supports are not disjoint, gives a fine criterion when you can take products of distributions or pullbacks of distributions or other operations. And he replaced the smooth locus by a finer concept, which is the micro locally smooth locus. It's in more variables. It gives, at the same time, the smooth locus and some bad or good directions. So this becomes a micro locally smooth locus. The singular support becomes what he called the wavefront or the wavefront set of the distribution. Um, so let me let me define that. So the wavefront set is a refinement of the singular support, and it needs a little bit of new notation. Right here. Um, it works with the dual vector spaces and uh, on it uh, or in it it works also with cotangent bundles and objects like that and, co and normal bundles and co-normal bundles so for Fn the tangent bundle is easy we can identify it with the product of Fn times Fn, with the uh, identification that I won't explain in detail, but also the cotangent bundle, T star of Fn, that somehow on the first factor it's the same, but on the second factor it's the dual vector space. So we can also identify it with Fn times Fn, but with different actions, different things into play. If you have a submanifold and you can take, for example, an analytic submanifold, or if you prefer, you can take a smooth algebraic subset of affine space and take the f-rational points. So it's, I mean, you're a smooth something smooth submanifold. And you can also form the tangent bundle of x. It's a subbundle of this one, so it's going to be a subset identified with a subset there, and you can form the cotangent bundle of x as a dual bundle, so to say, of tx. And um, you can also form the normal bundle of x into fn, by which I mean the quotient of, it's, it's like the quotient bundle of the embedding space divided by the tangent, uh, the tangent of the embedding divided by the tangent of the 
Uh, this is symbolic notation, but it's like in each point you have the quotient of the respective tangent spaces. And then you have the co-normal bundle of Fn of x in Fn. And that's the dual of this one. So here I will just put a star and quotation mark. So it's a dual. And they act on each other in very natural way. They are a way to think about orthogonal directions. I will make pictures very soon. But let me first make a picture when something is called micro-locally smooth. So I have a distribution on Fn, as before. Now I take a point x, y inside the cotangent bundle of where the distribution lives. So x is in Fn, and with our identification, y also lives in Fn. And such a point, so I have my point which is potentially smooth or potentially in the singular support, I add a, a direction in the cotangent space. And now I call this tuple micro-locally smooth, or not micro-locally smooth. Uh, so such a tuple is called micro, this is a long word, but micro-locally smooth. Uh, and I will de define it on a picture. If you want precise details, you need a lot of quantifiers. But it's not so nice to, to, to see what it does. But here on Fn, I take my first copy of Fn. And here I have the dual Fn. So for example, here is my point x. And here is my point y. What I do is the following things with putting quantifiers in the right way. You take a small open neighborhood very close by x. Maybe not containing x, but sufficiently close. So let me draw it like this. It's an open neighborhood u. I multiply the psi with the characteristic function of that open, small enough open close to x, maybe containing x, maybe not. And of this distribution, I take the Fourier transform. So this product is automatically a distribution. So I can take its Fourier transform. Um, I forgot to say. This class of CX distributions is also is stable under various operations, also like taking Fourier transforms and limits, for example. So I will be able to take this also in the CX class, but now I'm just with an abstract distribution. This distribution, where do I want to evaluate it? Well, I would like to evaluate it in Y, but apart from the Y, I will not take an open neighborhood. Instead, I will take a conic open neighborhood with all the multiples of a small uh, open neighborhood of y. And on that open neighborhood, here I can take a point y prime in here, in this cone. <coughs> cone, so I mean scalar multiplication, and you go further away. I can evaluate it in y prime. Why is that? Well, this Fourier transform happens to be a function on this space. So I can evaluate it at any point. And what I ask here is that this is eventual, uh, eventually 0. So if I go far enough away, here, it's identically 0. It's 0 if y prime is far enough, far, far enough up. So in a sense, it looks via the Fourier transform. And that's maybe why it's called wavefront, because the Fourier transform is, is like a wave or something. And it should, if it vanishes, the, wa the waves vanish, you call it microlocally smooth. The complement of the microlocally smooth locus is called the wavefront set. So the wavefront of psi is equal to those tuples x, y, which are not microlocally smooth. And for convenience, one also maybe sometimes one puts in the extra condition that y is non-zero. So that you're not, in the origin, it's not so interesting to take conic multiples. So that's not an interesting point. So there is the wavefront set. There is the, the locus of micro-locally smooth points. So what are they? We saw that 
If you only look at the smooth points, it's a zero locus. What about the micro locally smooth locus? That's a refinement. Is that also a zero locus? And what extra conditions to get the other way around? So that's uh, one question. Uh, let me. put on another question. Um, another question and another fact about abstract distributions. For an abstract distribution, this wavefront set can be almost everything. So in the periodic case, also in the real case. So a fact, for any, or any even, any uh, closed and conic set, and by conic I mean in the y variables, as before you can take multiples in, this, in the y variables, f, f, f star multiples, any closed conic set is a wavefront. for some distribution. That's the result by her render. Conic. It means in the y variable you can take f multiples. So from your field. F multiples. Yes, so scalar multiples like in the, in the drawing. So if it's conic, it's a wavefront set. And if it's closed. Another fact is that the projection, the projection of the wavefront set is always equal to the singular support of psi. So it's in this sense that the wavefront set refines the singular support. The same projection does not hold for the microlocally smooth locus. The, if you project the microlocally smooth locus, you might find something else than the, well, something slightly different. So that's another fact. Um, so the question one that I raised is uh, if psi is of CX class, what is, sorry for the noise, the micro locally smooth locus of psi? Let me abbreviate it like that. What is it? Let me also right away mention a question that was raised by Eisenbutt and Rinfeld in a recent paper of theirs. Question two. Does there exist a natural um, or a, a natural <coughs> class, subclass of WF holonomic distributions, which I will define, holonomic distributions, which is stable under Fourier transformation. So as I said, RCS class is stable under Fourier transformation. So this question would then become, this candidate question would become, are the CX distributions WF holonomic. I can partially answer, but first define that notion. What is WF holonomicity here? Well, on the reals, there is a very natural notion of holonomicity which comes from D modules which is very, uh, yeah. Um, but here in the periodics, there is not a clear notion. So Drinfeld and Eisenbutt, they come up with an analogous notion, which is a bit more ad hoc than in the real case. They call it WF holonomicity, as opposed to holonomicity for D modules. Which is, uh, so this is a candidate notion, and it's not stable under Fourier transform, while in the reals, it's usually stable under Fourier transform. Um, what does it mean? A distribution is WF holonomic 
if and only if Wf of xi is contained in a finite union e one to n of co-normal bundles of sub-varieties. And let me just write it out. Co-normal bundles of xi in fn. And this means actually the following. If you have um, fn here, you have the dual space here. You have a smooth thing here, which is smooth. For each of these points here, you will have, so to say, the orthogonal line in here. So for each of these points, you have a line. And here, if you have a point, if some of the xi is a point, on that point, the co-normal bundle is the whole, is everything, all the lines. On the other hand, if you would have a surface, um, uh, well, yeah, then now I'm, I'm taking it, drawing in F2 here. So it's, a, 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 in particular, it's a condition of the dimension. Um, this thing has dimension, in particular, at most n. As you see, if the co-dimension goes down here, up to a point, you get a higher dimension here, and vice versa. And moreover, it's a kind of orthogonality. These co-normal bundles are sometimes called isotropic because uh, the, some natural symmetric form vanishes on it. Um, but moreover, they are also called Lagrangian, which is even more specific. They're isotropic of maximal dimension, these pieces. On that point, I have the whole fan of lines. So it's of maximal, it's called, sometimes called Lagrangian also. So what is the result that we have? If xi is of CX class, you're going to guess it something is going to be a zero locus. But what is a zero locus? I have something and I have a complement. I have the micro locally smoothing and it's complement the wave fronts. One is going to be a zero locus and the other not. Here, it's the micro locally smooth locus of xi is going to be a zero locus of CX class function. Of a CX class function. But we know a bit more. It cannot be anything, as we saw before. The smooth locus needs to be dense, open. Here also we have some extra information. Um, the wave front set, well, or more conveniently, xi is automatically WF holonomic. But there you go. So this is uh, an answer to the question by Drinfeld and Eisenbutt. Because they, in their paper, they studied a lot of distributions, which all are of CX class. They're all of CX class. And they proved their holonomicity for these distributions. So now we have holonomicity for all these distributions of this class. And we have stability under Fourier transform. So we find a natural subclass with both that you can manipulate and you, you remain geometrically nice. But we don't have a converse yet. And we think this is not enough to have a converse. So if you, I mean, if you have um, just an abstract zero locus whose complement satisfies such a kind of inclusion, so the holonomicity condition, we don't know if you can construct a distribution with that specific wavefront set. Um, Maybe we need extra, extra conditions. Uh, we have a, a working can candidate, but uh, it's not yet a result. Um, so what, how to prove that it is holonomic in this sense? What are the ingredients to prove that? Well, there is a technical lemma uh, saying that, uh, talking about sums of distributions, tensor products of distributions, so that you can do basic operations. But then there is, um, uh, we, we use a kind of resolution of singularities for definable functions that we develop 
using Hironaka, but also using techniques by Deneff and Van den Dries, and combining that with techniques from Van den Dries, Haskell, and McPherson. So this, through, yeah, Hironaka, in this context, apply to definable functions. Not terms, but definable functions. Gives you a, a kind of embedded resolution for definable functions. And that allows you, with extra work, to reduce to product situation. You can do induction on dimension. And on the way we go, we find also a regularization result. So if you have a distribution on a dense open, you can extend it to the whole set and stay in the CX class. So you can extend it uh, in a way, and that's kind of part of the, the proof. So I have, uh, I will use my last two minutes. As I mentioned before, some things work better in the reals than in the piadics, but here are some things that work better in the piadics than in the reals. And now let me briefly say some work with Servi, Comte, Rollin, and Miller, and also some with Eisenberg in this context. If you have a definable set in Rn, so I briefly sketch the real situation where I use the, the sub-analytic language as to say what is definable. I can form a similar algebra Cx of functions generated by definable functions from x to r, the logarithm of definable functions, and an additive character of a definable function. So the three generators are there again, and you close up a little bit more under integration, which was not needed in the Piedic case, under integration. And we made that explicit what kind of function you need to add, but I will just write here, close up. This is stable under Fourier transform. And you can talk about distributions which have a continuous wavelet transform with modern wavelet, the Gaussian. So the Gaussian function is inside, strangely enough. Uh, so you can take the wavelet transform with respect to that modern wavelet, the continuous wavelet transform. If that is of this class, you call the distribution also of that class. So you can talk about various things as before, the low C, and see what low C do what for you. And you can talk about the wavefront, it's analogous, and the micro-locally smooth thing. And you can talk about holonomicity. So one of the questions that we are addressing in, uh, that's work in progress is uh, about analytic holonomicity. There is no chance here to be algebraically holonomic. But it's about analytic holonomicity, which is a local notion related to local D modules. And strangely enough, this variant of holonomicity is not stable under Fourier transform. So you can ask the Greenfeld Eisenwood question also here is there a natural subclass of analytically holonomic distributions which is stable under Fourier transformation? And our guess is that the CX class is analytically holonomic and stable under Fourier transform. So that's work in progress. But we know much less about loci. Even the starting point loci of integrability are only understood in low dimensional cases. Because real integrability with oscillation and with this closing up under integration is subtle and hard. So the loci have been less understood. So the calculus with limits is, is partially also OK. So this is half check, half, half a check. But uh, there are the, the universal quantification, I think it's OK. But I'm just quoting out of my head now here. So there is work to do on the low C. 
and you need all these limits and this eventual behavior to see that things are low C. Like for example here, something needed to vanish identically if you go far away. So that's like an eventual vanishing, that kind of condition. You need to work out that this remains a zero lo locus. Eventual vanishing is not the same as identical vanishing. So we need a formalism here that hopefully will be developed soon. And then maybe we can say that the micro locally smooth locus here is also a zero locus. Who knows? So I thank you here for the work.